and welcome to Liberty or Bigotry, Religious Freedom in America. My name is Kelly Damro. I'm the Director of Federal and State Affairs with the Secular Coalition for America. Basically, that means I am the federal level lobbyist. A little bit before we begin, when I say bigotry, I mean the Merriam-Webster dictionary definition of a person who's intolerantly devoted to his or her own opinions and prejudice. Some synonyms that they give are dogmatist, sectarian. That's how I'm uh, putting the word bigotry out there. And a little bit about me. I grew up in Florida, so I'm a, a girl of the South. I did elementary and, and um, elementary education, got a bachelor's and master's degree from the University of Florida, go Gators, if I have any Gators out there. <laughs> Ooh, we'll see you in Jacksonville. I'm not going to make any big hype. It's, we'll call it a rebuilding year. <laughs> so after getting my master's, I moved to Melbourne where I taught kindergarten for a year, which uh, is great to introduce yourself as a kindergarten teacher because everybody loves kindergarten teachers. And with my naive optimism about changing the world, I went back to law school, again at UF, and became a lawyer. And people don't like lawyers quite as much as they like kindergarten teachers. <laughs> Uh, but they still talk to them at parties if they have uh, a cousin who needs legal advice. <laughs> and they still trust what they have to say. And I took the bar in Florida and moved to Washington, D.C. to start working in policy, where I found the Secular Coalition, which covers all the things that I care about so deeply and passionately in one place and lobbies for them on Capitol Hill. And so I became a lobbyist, which people like even less than lawyers. <laughs> Especially when you lobby on the two things you're not supposed to talk about in polite company, religion and politics. It became uh, a challenge to introduce myself uh, at parties with small talk, but then it also becomes kind of fun, especially when you can say you are the atheist lobbyist, just to see people's reactions. <laughs> but as good skeptics, I don't expect you to take my anecdotal evidence, so I do actually have data and research that shows that people trust and like grade school teachers a lot. <laughs> and then a little bit farther down, you have lawyers. And this is where people start to question my character, but they still trust my advice. And this is where I lost them. <laughs> but I don't mind a challenge. And Capitol Hill is certainly a place full of challenges for those who believe in reason and science. So the mission and the purpose of my organization, the Secular Coalition for America, is to increase the visibility and respect for non-theistic viewpoints in the United States and to protect and strengthen the secular character of our government as the best guarantee of freedom for all. And that last part is especially important, that it is the best way to get freedom for everyone to have a strong separation of church and state. And our purpose is to advocate on behalf of non-theistic and secular Americans. And advocating for separation of church and state, uh, we think, is the best way to go about that. Some of the issues that we've had to cover, some violations of church-state separation that come up all too frequently, restrictions on who can get married, religious definition of civil marriage. So most people don't realize there's two types of marriage. There's civil and there's religious. Well, I say most people, I don't mean most people in this room because you're obviously a highly educated, intelligent bunch. But most people out there don't realize that religious marriage, ceremonial marriage, in a church, they can choose to marry or not marry whoever they do or don't want to. They can not marry uh, two women. They can not marry you for your race. They are allowed to do that. But we're talking about civil marriage. When the government gets involved and there is a law about who can and can't get married and it's based on religion, that is wrong. So we work on correcting a religious definition of civil marriage and make, making sure that it is a secular definition. Government officials endorsing religion. So this is opening a legislative session with a prayer or oaths of office that have to end with, so help me God. Taxpayer money, furthering religious belief. This is a huge problem that really doesn't get a lot of attention or press, but a lot of federal grants and state grants go to religious charities to do work in adoption or women's health services, and they're allowed to 
discriminate based on religion in their hiring and firing practices. They're allowed to not provide a full spectrum of services. And they're doing all of this and promoting their religion with taxpayer dollars. And this, this came about under President Bush and remains under President Obama. And it's a really, really big problem uh, that doesn't get a lot of attention that we work on. And religiously based policy. So this is just an overall, anytime government officials are relying on personal beliefs and not high quality research when making decisions, that is a problem. We saw a particularly egregious example of this recently, just a few weeks ago, Representative Steve Palazzo, he's a Republican from Mississippi, he sent a copy of the Bible to every member of Congress. And with it, he sent a letter on official letterhead. And usually these are private, but I was able to get a copy. And it's just a picture of it, so I apologize for the fuzziness. But if you can't read it, I'll, don't worry, I'll go through it. So he says, on a daily basis, we contemplate policy decisions that impact America's future. Our staffs provide us with policy memos, statistics, and recommendations that help us make informed decisions. So far, so good. However, oh, I find that the best advice comes through meditating on God's word. Not stats, not data, not experts. Ignore those. Please find a copy of the Holy Bible to help guide you in your decision making. Absolutely not. This is just blatantly unconstitutional and the decisions of our government, which impact every American, should not be based on religion at all and especially not one particular view of religion. He continues, this copy is provided as an inspirational and informational resource to you by Mr. J.B. Atchison, a constituent <clears throat> donor of mine from Southern Mississippi. Surprise. If there's anything I can do for you, please do not hesitate to contact me. So I encourage you to take him up on his kind offer. <laughs> and please feel free to contact Representative Palazzo and let him know what you think about telling members of Congress to base their decisions on his copy of the Bible. Because this letter here, it's written on official congressional letterhead. And it's one of my favorite parts of the upper right hand corner. It says that he is on the committee for uh, the House Science, Space and Technology Committee. And it's from his office. And he is a part of the House leadership. He's the deputy whip. He is a member of Congress speaking from a place on a, of authority on official letterhead, not his personal letterhead. And nobody really batted an eye at this. This didn't get that much attention. It didn't make the mainstream news or, or CNN. And the reason, uh, the reason I think that happened is because as a country, we're becoming numb to these mentions of God and government in the same breath. And so I have a kind of hypothetical question for everyone. If you were here two years ago, you may have answered it and the answer may have even gotten worse. Do you remember a time when it was absurd to pay $5 for a single cup of coffee? Anybody? Yeah. yeah? I don't, and I bet a lot of the people in the room don't, and even more out the door don't. Coffee's always been $5 a cup. It's nothing different to us because that's how it's always been as long as we can remember. And these instances of mentioning God and government have been that way as long as a lot of the people who are now running things can remember. Because uh, I don't remember a Pledge of Allegiance without Under God because I graduated after 1954. And I don't remember uh, a time without a National Day of Prayer uh, because that was added in 1952. And I don't ever know uh, our national motto being anything but in God we trust, even though that was only changed in 56. And as the generations change and the newer generations take hold, increasingly they think this is how it has always been. And a lot of people say, okay, so what's the big deal? There's a lot of really major harms going on out there. And these instances are often pushed aside uh, as what's called ceremonial deism. And this means uh, a nominally religious statement or practices deemed to be merely ritual and not to have 
uh, deep religious meaning anymore, and they've lost that religious meaning through customary usage. But this term was invented by the Supreme Court to justify why in God we trust is okay as our national motto. So think about that. The reason this is okay is because we came up with a reason for it to be okay. And each one of these incidents might be small, but together they have a huge impact. And I like to compare them to product placement. So it, you have commercials where 30 seconds you see full on advertising, it's in your face and you know about it. But Increasingly, especially with DVRs and skipping commercials, we're seeing more and more product placement where they just subtly put mentions of the product with the people you like and the shows you like, and you don't even realize it, but halfway through Modern Family, you really want a Coke. And this is kind of what I'm seeing happen with ceremonial deism. It's similar to product placement, just put behind people who are speaking in places of authority, and we hear them often enough and with enough confidence that they start to become the truth. And we're bombarded with this misinformation for so long that people really start to believe it. This information takes hold, misinformation takes hold and becomes the basis for a lot of these unnecessary debates and really truly terrible public policy. Uh, some that you've probably debated yourself. America was founded as a Christian nation. <laughs> My sentiments exactly. As that is being pushed more and more as a truth, we're hearing the argument come from that. The next step is freedom of religion is the freedom just to practice Christianity. And people are really starting to believe that that's okay because they already believe the other fact, the other myth as a fact. But in re reality, the idea of a Christian nation and true religious freedom, they cannot coincide. Oh, I like this one. Creationism is an alternative theory to evolution. Therefore, Students should learn both theories and decide for themselves. <laughs> We've been fighting this one in the states with our state chapters uh, since the, they were created three years ago. Uh, we've defeated bills in, in states like Montana that wanted equal time to tr teach. Uh, they, they call them critical thinking. They're stealing our words to, to push these, this misinformation on uh, students in science classes. But we know evolution is not debated among scientists. And when we use the term, uh, the theory of evolution, we know that means the scientific theory and not uh, the, the common usage of the word theory. And creationism isn't a theory, it's a story. So it's not gonna go in science class. Teaching sex education will make teenagers promiscuous. Therefore, abstinence is the only safe sex education. I liken this one to uh, teaching a 16-year-old to use a seatbelt when they drive. This doesn't make them want to drive more. They already want to drive. <laughs> teaching them to use a seatbelt makes them a safer driver for them and for everyone else on the road. And then religious freedom is an absolute constitutional right. That means religious freedom exempts you from any law that violates your religious belief. Sorry to say no. You can be fired or not hired if your religious belief precludes you from doing the central duties with that job. And that might sound ridiculous, but uh, there's actually a case in Florida, oh, my, st my state. Uh, oh. <laughs> Weird and proud. But uh, every state has their share of crazies. I think we just have a few more. So this is the case of Sarah Helwig. She's an anti-choice uh, mid, uh, nurse midwife, and she's suing a federally funded family planning clinic in Tampa for religious discrimination because they declined to hire her after she said she refused to provide prescribed birth control pills because she believed they are abort efficients. She's a trained nurse a federally funded clinic wouldn't hire her. And she says that's discrimination because they wouldn't hire me to not do a job. 
Sorry, Sarah, it's not gonna work out for you. <sighs> but we've been thinking that, right? With all these different court cases that have been coming through, they're more and more ridiculous, and uh, well, that's never gonna go through, that's never gonna pass, that's never gonna get the okay, and more of them are. In fact, all three branches of government are expanding the laws in situations where religious freedom is just trumping any other law. And we've seen, we've seen the basis for ceremonial deism in the 50s, but in the 90s, it took a whole new turn when we saw the passage of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, uh, also known as RIFRA. And a lot of our problems today stem from this law. It passed Congress in 93 and was signed into law by President Clinton uh, with an overwhelming, almost unanimous support across the aisle. And this bill came about because of a Supreme Court case, uh, the Smith case, where two Native American church members were fired for using peyote, an illegal drug, in their religious ceremony. And Justice Scalia, who believed a little differently 20 years ago, his opinion held that a law that applied to everyone and was not directed at religion specifically was not a violation of religious freedom. So of course, RIFRA had to fix that problem by preventing laws that substantially burden a person's free exercise of religion. However, in the 20 years since that law's passage, words like substantially and exercise of religion and person have been <laughs> it, interpreted very differently from how they were originally intended. Still, the Supreme Court decided not to apply RIFRA to the states, but the states did not let that stop them. They took it into their own hands, and of course, like some states do, they took it way too far. In April, Mississippi became the 19th state to enact its own RIFRA, which essentially legalizes discrimination against LGBT individuals by people as well as by businesses, as long as your discrimination is religiously motivated. Plain and simple, this is bigotry. This is legally protected bigotry. And these laws are why the Secular Coalition started our No Hate, No Exceptions campaign, because religion is never a good justification for discrimination. And uh, you might remember there was a kerfuffle in Arizona a few months back of a similar law that wanted to allow businesses to refuse to serve uh, LGBT individuals and others uh, for a religious reason. We heard a lot about that law, but we didn't hear the title that much. The title was the Religious Freedom Restoration Act because this is what it's become. It didn't pass there, but they already have laws in the books that protect most discrimination by anyone short of a for-profit organization. But not to fear, the Supreme Court took care of that. RIFRA was the basis for the Hobby Lobby decision. So a little background, uh, the Hobby Lobby was sued over the stipulation in President Obama's health care law, which required employer-provided health insurance to cover contraceptives. Hobby Lobby's owners claimed this violated their religious freedom because they believe contraceptives could be abortive. In June, the Supreme Court ruled that some closely held for-profit corporations could be exempt for, from providing contraceptive coverage to employees on the basis of corporations' religious beliefs. They made it the law that beliefs trump facts and data. The facts and data that the Institute of Medicine and the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology based their recommendation on. Belief trumps the research showing that access to cost-free contraception improves social and economic status for women. And the belief of a wealthy business owner even trumps the belief of the hardworking American employee. 13,000 employees work at Hobby Lobby, but their freedom to choose the life they want to live is subject to the owners of this corporation. When coupled with the word religion, there's a gross misunderstanding of the word freedom. You have the right to hold a religious belief, if that's your choice. It's not a requirement to believe, and it's certainly not a requirement what to believe. Freedom means autonomy. It's the right to make the decisions that define us. It guarantees that you, no one else, choose how to live your life, including your boss. With certain exceptions, your employer can't fire you for getting pregnant. 
It's your right to have a family. Your right to have kids. But do you still have a right not to have a family? And one of the biggest decisions in a woman's life is when or if she chooses to have children. That's deciding her future. And we fully protect her right to have children. But since Hobby Lobby, we don't protect her right not to or to choose when. If there are two options and one of those options is taken away, do you really have a choice? Is that really freedom? Okay, so Hobby Lobby was a terrible decision, but it's also a turning point. More people are recognizing that this is a problem and more people are starting to really question the definition of religious liberty that's being pushed. And since this, this problem spans all three branches of government, the Secular Coalition decided that we would show all three branches of government that bending over backwards to religious extremists is not what the majority of Americans want. So we asked people, if the Hobby Lobby decision made you angry, did it make you so angry you wanted to knit a brick? And this was the beginning of a campaign where we asked our supporters to knit three by six inch red bricks with yarn purchased somewhere other than Hobby Lobby. <laughs> or if you're not knittingly inclined, you could sponsor a staff member for $25 to knit a brick for you. And then mail them in and we're going to knit them into a wall. All these bricks bringing together, rebuilding the wall of separation between church and state. We promised that if we received 400 bricks, that we would take the wall to the Supreme Court. We thought we wouldn't have to worry about that. It's not going to happen. Uh, 800 bricks, and we'd take it to Congress. 1,200 bricks, and we would take it to the White House. So in a few days, the bricks started trickling in. And we posted regular updates on social media so people could see how the campaign was going. Uh, and then in another week or two, they started flooding in. And most of them came with these fantastic letters. They said, I learned how to knit just so I could contribute to the, your campaign. <laughs> Those were the really um, uniquely shaped bricks. <laughs> uh, I love <laughs> the ones that said, I knit this with my daughter while telling her about the importance of what's happening and why we are knitting. Someone said, you have allies in non-Christian religious folks, too. And I got one that said, I am not a secular humanist, but even progressive Christians, such as I, believe in strongly in separation of religion and government. That one really made me happy. But I especially wanted to share my two favorite letters with you. This one says, hi, my name is Sky. I'm 11 years old, and I'm going into the sixth grade. I read about what you're doing and wanted to help. I hope that by mailing this brick, I have helped you with your project to rebuild the wall between church and state. And that's a good knitted brick. <laughs> and my other favorite from right here in Atlanta, I'm a Presbyterian pastor, and I'm concerned about the same issues you are. I hope these bricks will help put up that much needed wall between church and state. Thank you for your good work, Reverend Betsy. Names chain to protect uh, anonymity. But from right here in Atlanta, I mean, that one really knocked my thoughts off, really uh, got a little misty-eyed in the office, just knowing that we aren't alone and that some people get it. Sky's Brick and Betsy's Brick gave me hope for the future that can sometimes be hard to find in DC and that motivation to keep going. So support from this, for this campaign really swept across the country. We, across the world, we got bricks from Norway, bricks from Japan, a few from Canada, and every single state except Montana. <laughs> but I think they get a pass because they've got like 100 people living there, so. <laughs> but if you know anyone from Montana, we'd love to be able to say we got a brick from every state. And Guam. I'll take one today. <laughs> We're actually, um, 
We're not accepting any more new bricks because we're in the process of putting the wall together. Because, thank you. Oh. It is a very daunting task because as of um, right before I left to get on the plane, our final count, we had reached 1,600 bricks. <laughs> but it's not, it's not too late to get involved, so we're not accepting bricks anymore because we have to put all those bricks together. <laughs> Except Montana's. Uh, but there are still some unclaimed bricks, so you know, if, you, if you still want to get involved and help us show Congress what we really need, uh, you can still sponsor a brick, and I'll be around and we have a table out, uh, out there that you can please come and talk to me or learn more about what we're doing. You can also help us make good on our promise and participate in or promote our Knit a Brick March. So we're doing it, we're knitting the wall together, and on September 9th at high noon, we're taking it to the Supreme Court. It's going to be a, a humongous event. And if you are anywhere in the area, I highly encourage you to join. If you're not, you can join on social media through Facebook or on Twitter with the Nitabrick or Nitabrick March. But we realize that it's, it's time. It's time to walk right up to Congress's door and say enough is enough. When it comes to RIFRA, we cannot keep moving the goalposts. The religious right has pushed it to the breaking point and now it's broken. The world we live in is the one that Justice Scalia actually predicted when he wrote the Smith decision in 93. He wondered if a man could excuse his illegal actions if they were religiously motivated and then he answered his own question. To permit this would be to make the professed doctrines of religious belief superior to the law of the land, and in effect to permit every citizen to become a law unto himself. Scalia wrote those words. But that's what Riffra's done. Every belief is now its own law, whether or not it flies in the face of factual accuracy. Because where religious belief is used as a get out of reality free card, RIFRA makes it a literal and actual get out of jail free card because the laws that apply to everyone else no longer apply to you. But the wave of change is starting with our march and then when we get to Congress, we're gonna ask them to repeal RIFRA. Enough is enough, it needs to go. This definition of religious freedom has been torn up and rewritten so many times that it doesn't even look like freedom anymore. Freedom is choosing your own path. When the religion of another makes that choice for you, your freedom's gone, your freedom's lost. The separation between church and state has been blurred beyond recognition. But I think the, the journalist, Kath Apollett, she put this more eloquently than I ever could. Somehow, the separation of church and state has come to mean blocking the state from protecting the civil rights of citizens and forcing it to support and pay for sectarianism, bigotry, superstition, and bullying. It's time. Let's stand up to bullies. Thank you. I'm happy to take um, any questions that anyone wants to fire away at, at me. There's a microphone right up here in the, in the center of the room. Hey. Hi. Hey, Chuck, how's it going? How would you respond to a statement, um, and this is a paraphrase, from the Reverend James Henderson, who is the head of the Christian Coalition of Alabama? And the statement goes something like this. There is something known as a just war. God will strike down abortion providers. And furthermore, he says, he is not bound by man's law, but God's law. How would I respond to him if he said that? Yes. 
I would say that I would ask him to envision a society where everyone is bound by their own God's law. Whatever God they choose and no common agreement, common values among citizens. And how would he like to live in that world? Uh, a world where my religion says there's no such color as red, so I don't stop at any lights. <laughs> uh, I bring that up because that is increasingly the reality that we're seeing out. Not, not just in Alabama. Alabama's bad. We all know that it's bad. <laughs> but we see it everywhere now. Yeah. Thank you, Chuck. Hi there. Hello. I have probably... 24 different questions I would like to ask you. I'm just going to pick the one that probably isn't the most depthful, but the most salacious. Um, <laughs> so uh, in terms of religion, another word that I've seen replace that is the word morality. This is the moral thing to do. And They obviously you, haven't read the Bible. <laughs> clearly. I actually hear that from a lot of atheists, so we're going to talk about moral value. Um, but what... Where do you see the curve going in terms of the sexual laws that we've passed in this country, mm. uh, which is why I just figured I'd go with the most salacious, uh, and, and where we've come, where we've gone, and what, where we've come, yeah, uh, where we've gone and where that's, what, what trend do you see with that? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so by sexual laws, I, I assume you mean referring to like reproductive rights and, and, or more like privacy laws? Sure, everything from gay laws to I mean, things that, I mean, you, you, could, you could talk about things which are obviously harmful, like uh, pedophilia laws mm -hmm. to things mm -hmm. which are, um, uh, you know, we used to have laws about uh, black people and white people couldn't marry. So mm -hmm. just, just it, it, all, all of these different ideas, they've taken on a lot of different twists and turns. Mm -hmm. So just in general, right. w w what's the trend and trajectory of that? Thank you. Well, I would say that... Doctrine doesn't seem to change with public opinion, but shortly after, as donations start to drop, certain pieces of the dogma also conveniently get pushed out. There are many different uh, pieces of doctrine that are no longer followed, and I think that some of the, the different religions are starting to s already see that it's not in their best fiscal interest or uh, keeping enough uh, butts in the pews interest to keep going against uh, a chain, rapidly changing public opinion about um, LGBT individuals. And I mean, it's the fastest changing opinion of this type of uh, civil rights issue that we've seen uh, it, ever, but definitely in our recent history. And when it comes to the laws, they also, it seems the positions of politicians change with public opinion. Uh, so I would say the, the opinion shift comes first, and then we'll see the, the positions of politicians change shortly after because uh, you're their bosses and they like keeping their jobs, whatever they have to say. Thank you. All right, my, my first question is actually a pithy question in regards to when you're delivering the bricks to the Supreme Court, are you worried about violating their personal safety bubble that they felt <laughs> the, the right to take away from the regular public? You know, the, the crazy thing about the Supreme Court is they have this, this huge, grandiose uh, walk up to it and, and these great marble stairs, but for, I mean, it, it's something like 200 feet, you, you aren't allowed to protest or rally, like they are kept very far away from all the people whose lives they're deciding. Yeah. Um, but we did get a permit for where we're allowed <laughs> to stand. That, that was a face bomb for a moment for me when I read about that one. Um, but my, my real question is, in, in, your, in your dealing, in your, uh, as a lobbyist dealing with, with Congress and the various politicians, I, I'm, I'm sure you've used this argument, like with the, the, the argument against RIFRA, what, what is the response when you bring up Sharia law and how what they're trying to target a RIFRA for applies directly to right. Sharia law as well, and what's their, their response to that? 
it's amazing the the boxes that they're able to think in that these are just totally separate things and um, laws based on the religion I believe well that that's just laws based on morality right that's not uh, the dangerous and, and terrible laws of, of Sharia law they you can't even get them to realize that basing law and religion means any religion any belief you can't even get them to, to realize they're the same thing. So that's what, I've, that's what I've experienced. I just have to move past that point onto a point, something that might be more persuasive, something where they haven't uh, put up a hole, on their own wall in their mind. Wow, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Hi, okay, so um, first off, I just wanna say uh, I'm an atheist. I'm also a libertarian though. Mm -hmm. So um, um, about the Hobby Lobby you know, case, mm -hmm. Uh, I'm just curious what your stance is on the constitutionality of it, because I, I, I totally agree with the, the separation of church and state, 100%. Right. I agree with getting rid of, you know, the in God we trust and, you know, in the, uh, in the pledge and on the dollars and mm -hmm. our currency and, and you know, all, all that stuff. But I also agree with voluntary transactions, and employment is a voluntary transaction. So if someone chooses to work for Hobby Lobby and that employee or that employer decides to give whatever sort of you know, uh, health care or, or payment or, you know, whatever to that employee, that's a voluntary transaction. Why would the government have anything to say in that transaction? If they removed the, the, force, the forcing of that employer to provide something, to me that's a good thing. I'm not saying I agree with the, re the religiality of it, but as far as the voluntary, you know, uh, uh, free market uh, side of it, I, I do agree with it in, in that mm -hmm. sense. So, I mean, what would you say to sure. that? Sure. We have... Um of course, a lot of libertarian supporters. And I would say the first thing, the, the step one of our Nidabrick campaign was take your business somewhere else. I mean, that's a great way for us to, to show a comp private company that we disagree with what they're doing is don't, you know, don't be a patron of their company. And I would also say the, the example of, of Sarah Helwig from Tampa as a business, would you want to be forced to hire someone who can't do the job because you would be considered violating their religious liberty by not hiring them? So this was the nurse midwife mm -hmm. who said she could not uh, prescribe birth control pills uh, at a family planning clinic and is suing because uh, on, on a religious discrimination basis. Uh, so on the same token of forcing a business to do something or not do something uh, on a religious basis, telling a company that they can't not hire someone because of their, even if their religion precludes them from doing their job, would be, I think, far more intrusive uh, in the business world. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I, I agree with that sense, too, that right. the whole religious you know, freedom act or whatever it was called, the, what is it, R, RFRA? RFRA. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 I don't agree with that Sounds thing like either. Sounds like a sneezing dog. You're right, right, right. Yeah, I don't agree with that either. I, I'm, just, I'm just saying, in the specific example of the Hobby Lobby thing, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, the, Do the, I think it violates the Constitution? Yeah, yeah. Yes. You think it violates the Constitution? Yes. Where, where do you think it violates the Constitution? Um, I think it, it pushes the, well, I think it violates the religious freedom of the employees, number one. I think... Uh, when we talk about religious freedom, we're talking about the rights of an individual and just saying that this is a right of a corporation and that a corporation has a conscience. Uh, I wish more corporations had consciences, uh, but they, they don't. Um, but if it's, if, but, but if it's yeah. voluntary, then how is it violating it? If it's a voluntary trans transaction? It's not a voluntary transaction. It's a uh, government. Okay, so the, in the standard that Scalia set in the Smith case, as he interpreted the Constitution, was that if a law does not target your religion, that you have to follow the same laws as everybody else. Requiring contraception as part of employer-provided health care plans had nothing to do with religion. It was based on recommendations from the Institute of Medicine, and the, it was highly supported by the College on Obstetrics and Gynecology, and uh, it, there was economic research, there was social research, and in fact, most uh, healthcare plans provide contraception because it's a lot cheaper for the insurance company if you don't get pregnant. Uh, so there's one fiscal reason for uh, providing it. 
And it was uh, a law based on a lot of solid reasoning, research, and evidence. And they were asking for an exemption from that law. Uh, and it was just three steps removed. There was, no subs there was no burden on their religion. Their religious exercise was in no way impaired because no, no one was making them take contraception pills. No one was making them even pay for contraception pills. It was part of the salary of an employee part of the benefits and salary of an employee, and then they can choose if they want to even partake in that. It was so many steps removed from actually being a burden on their religious practice. That's why I didn't violate the Constitution. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so in the U.S., I feel like uh, the separation of church and state is something that's really pushed more by atheists or agnostics or secular humanists than it is religious folk, which I would feel if I were particularly religious, mm -hmm. I would be even more adamant about the separation of church and state because as much as I don't want religion in my government, if I were religious, I really wouldn't want government in my religion because mm -hmm. I can switch governments. It's harder to switch a religion, right? Mm -hmm. Why do you think uh, religious people in the U.S. haven't picked up on that? and made that jump of like, well, if step yeah. one is okay, a Christian United States government, step two is then a more specific Christian United States government that mm -hmm. I might not fit into anymore. Yeah, there was a lot of uh, you know, infighting, especially amongst what eventually became the religious right before they became <laughs> the religious right. And they finally agreed to put uh, their, their differences aside to come together and have this uh, completely illegal influence on politics. <laughs> and, <laughs> I would say that some of the religious groups uh, are starting to wake up, and we work with a lot of them, the, uh, like Catholics for Choice, uh, Baptist Joint Committee, and um, even uh, the, the nuns, N-U-N-S, nun, actual Catholic nuns. Um, but there is a inherent hierarchical system when it comes to religion, and when the bishops say, this is religious freedom, the nuns are expected to fall in line. And it's finally getting pushed far enough that the nuns are fighting back, which is what we're going to really need to get this past, you know, the hump of only being atheists exactly. and agnostics right. to, to support it. And having moderate religious people and, and religious people who do get that point of, this is good for the church mm -hmm. too, um, speak up and speak out louder uh, and not be shouted down by the squeakiest of wheels is what's going to take it to the next level. So uh, my question is uh, regarding, so shortly after the Hobby Lobby decision, mm -hmm. the Satanist church in like Wisconsin filed mm -hmm. suit regarding their, I guess they call them informed consent or whatever, right. you know, term they use about mm -hmm. the abortion. So my question is, 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 does that, kind of suit have any chance of getting any kind of traction like to me like i don't know any of the legal bits of it but mm -hmm. logically it seems sound to me right. and then it, you know does that have any chance of getting any traction and do you think politically that that's a good thing or a bad thing uh mm -hmm. that kind of thing thank you uh for your question i know what you're referring to it's um in oklahoma they have informed consent laws where a woman has to you know besides the 24-hour waiting period and, and all that before she gets an abortion her doctor has to read her a description about what she's um, doing to her baby, and they make her look at sonograms. Um, it's a really cruel process. And uh, the, the Satanists are suing there that they have a religious belief in factual medical information. <laughs> I think it has both uh, positive and, and negative aspects to it. The positive being, um, well, it's going to help the women of Oklahoma. And it, it shows a little bit the hypocrisy. Um, but negative is, is having to use belief as like a gateway to get to facts. Yeah. Not being able to just cut out the middleman and say, just give us the facts. Just the facts, ma'am. Do you think it's going to get traction in the courts, though? I do. It's, it'll be a little, it's Oklahoma, so you never know. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, quick question before the main question. Um, do you think the Smith case on peyote was correctly decided? 
Mm. Wow. Yes. Okay. Um, if your answer had been otherwise, I would have asked how you square that with your opinion on Hobby Lobby, but that sounds consistent to me. <laughs> I gave the right answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, primarily though, uh, given your uh, actual job mm -hmm. um, as, a, as a federal lobbyist, what pending legislation is there right now that you would consider to be most concerning, perhaps to mm -hmm. us as constituents? Um, and to limit that somewhat, I'm, I'm not talking about stuff that you expect to just die in committee, as right. silly stuff, but something Things that actually, that'll actually has potential of being passed. Right. Um, Good question. So there are a lot of uh, what we call messaging bills. They know they're not going to pass, but they put them out there to make their constituents happy. And, you know, we have to come out against them. But the real, the real work happens behind the scenes. And we can't um, talk about it too much on a large stage, but I trust you guys. You won't tell anybody. <laughs> um, so one bill that I recently uh, was able to, to get stopped was a bill to allow Christian scientists to be exempt from the requirement to buy health insurance because they don't believe in doctors. And I had to, to go around to Senate offices and make the really uh, huge logical jump that the law, the, the ACA doesn't require you to go to the doctor, it requires you to buy health insurance. If you don't believe in health insurance, like Amish and, and some Old Order Mennonites because they believe in taking care of their own community, then you are exempt. Uh, but if we start down this road of what you don't believe in is like, or do believe in is, is three steps removed, four steps removed from what the law actually requires, uh, you're going down a real dangerous path, especially when it comes to the insurance, uh, the insurance mandate and everyone having to, to buy in for it to be successful. And this is where having um, knowledge of the legislative process was very helpful because they knew this bill wasn't going to pass if it got voted on. But they were trying to get it uh, what's called UC, unanimous consent. And this is where the speaker just reads it out on the floor of the Senate and is like, this doesn't seem like something anyone would object to, right? Right? Okay. Boom. Pass. And it happens in the blink of an eye. And it happens with a lot of bills. And it's a really terrible thing for the legislative process. But behind the scenes when the different parties caucus in their different chambers, if a particular senator does object to that bill, they can use what's called a secret hold and say, you know, I'm going to use my secret hold on this bill. You got to use a lot of political capital to, to make it happen. But then that bill is blocked from unanimous consent and has to actually go for a vote, which nobody really wanted. They just wanted to make the Christian scientists in, in their states happy. And uh, I was able to convince the senator to use their political capital to put a, a secret hold on this bill so that we are not going to see it actually hit the floor. And that, uh, and that, that's something that uh, I've been particularly proud of and is just one, it's one more step towards this, this runaway train of anything is a burden on my belief. Having to pay the, the $600 for not having insurance substantially burdens me. So, thank you for your question. <clears throat> Most everyone can figure out the ties between RIFRA, Citizens United, and, and what that does to the political process. Mm -hmm. Do you ever see a world where the, the, the top 2% of churches, the mega churches, the Jerry Falwells, the Pat Robertsons, whose churches exist to make their pastors rich, mm -hmm. will have to justify their nonprofit status the way that a uh, non-denominational or, or uh, non-religious affiliated uh, nonprofit does like the Humane Society. They have to, they have to justify where their, where their funds go mm -hmm. before they can keep their nonprofit status. Do you ever think we'll get to a place where the churches have to do that too? For the mega churches, I do. I think for the mega churches, it's not even that far away because uh, even the people that go to them are starting to, to turn a little bit as they mm -hmm. see the private jets and the mansions and the Rolls Royces. Um, and I think there's a real possibility that they could set a number, a dollar cap of if you bring in so much money or if you spend so much money as a nonprofit, then you have to actually file more detailed, what's called a 990 form, an annual tax return form, um, even if you are a church. Mm -hmm. 
I don't see it in the immediate or, or even long-term future for the little neighborhood church. But even then, that most of those churches, it would, it, it would be as simple as filling out the form and it's done because most of those smaller churches do. Mm -hmm. They do their proper work. It's it, it's a postcard. I mean, there are a lot of churches that voluntarily do this because they want their uh, people to feel confident when they they drop their dollar in the basket, and um, they usually get the the services if there's a CPA in their flock who volunteers, and it, they answer. It's a postcard with like I think it's six questions on it, and those mm -hmm. questions are like, what's the name of your church? What's the address? And do you have a website? And then there's like one question that actually pertains to, have you spent uh, over $150,000? I just pulled that number out. I don't remember. Thank you very much. $58,000. Um, but that's too much for them to handle. So I'd like, I mean, that's one of the things we're, we're, we're working towards. Um, not in this Congress. Hi. Hi. So Scalia seems to be psychic. <laughs> Is this? He kind of fulfilled his own prophecy, though, didn't he? <laughs> That's true. In his dissent in Windsor, he was worried that by allowing eventually gay marriage, mm -hmm. will allow polygamy. I believe yesterday or day before yesterday, a Utah judge actually ruled against the ban against. Um, polygamy in Utah. Yeah. Do the rights of poly families, is it something that you try to avoid because it's a political bomb and you don't want to touch, or is it something that you might start working on at some point? Oh, uh, you know, in DC, it's really a tough place to, te to keep a broad coalition. Even, I mean, we do work with the uh, LGBT groups, like um, Human Rights Campaign and, and the task force. Uh, but even they keep a little bit of a distance from us because, you know, they're really starting to, like, take off and, and gain some ground and, um, you know, don't want to be uh, held back uh, at all by the touchiness of the word atheist. So when it comes to situations like that, anything that, that doesn't already have over 50% support in the public, everyone's a little cautious about going after or, or working with, and something as new as, as this case, and we'll have to, you know, see where it goes. Cause I'm sure it'll, it'll make its way up the system again. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. It have to be something we'd, you know, think about and look at before I could give an answer. But okay. Thanks Thank for you. letting me know. I'll look it up. Mm -hmm. Can I clarify that? They, they actually ruled that cohabiting was okay, not polygamy, but adults can cohabit. Okay. So. Thank you. Um, as a lobbyist, mm -hmm. do you feel the Congress is going to be able to enact any meaningful <laughs> legislation before the 2020 census? Or oh. is there, like you're trying to get the REFRA repealed, mm -hmm. is that the best use of your time and energy right now? Or <laughs> is there like a more fundamental thing that government needs to change? Because it seems like there is a movement right. in government to keep government from doing anything. And it's a sabotage movement almost. Um, you're not wrong about that. So we do a congressional scorecard uh, every year. And for the 2013 Congress, they voted on so few bills that we actually had to include any bills that they had sponsored in our scorecard. Uh, just, I mean, for the Senate, we'd have one vote. And we cover a lot of issues. But they just did so little, we had to, to broaden our horizon a little bit. But even with that, Congress may be doing nothing, but the courts are doing harm. Like the decisions that are coming down, um, uh, Greece versus Galloway, uh, the decision in Massachusetts about um, the Pledge of Allegiance, and uh, of course Hobby Lobby, are just so terrible that while we might have to wait for a new Congress, we definitely have to wait for a new Supreme Court bench before we take another case to them because they're just going to keep tearing it down. And there are things that get passed in these sneaky, less legislative ways. Uh, it just so happens that not a lot of them actually favor us. The reason that we go hard for the RIFRA repeal is because they need someone to hold their feet to the fire to even get them to the table to talk about amending it. And while I truly believe repealing it is the best thing to do, if we can at least 
get the other side to come and talk about defining a person to not include a corporation, I think that'll be a move in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Um, Hi. I, uh, I'm going to try to be quick. I tend to ramble. Oh, goodness. I'm, I'm so feel free to like poke me in the back if I talk too long. Right, because um, we only have time for two more. Oh no, oh no, okay. So like the first person who, who spoke, I'm also atheist, also very, very libertarian. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. um, people are often irrational. Um, no. And, yes. So <laughs> the, uh, if someone sets something up, a, an argument, so it's an us versus them, mm -hmm. or a, this, each person views the other as an enemy, they often don't make as much traction in finding common ground. Mm -hmm. And so for one, I'm wondering if, I want to give a few examples and wondering if you can comment on that and how to you know, switch things around so that people on the other side don't think of us as you know, evil, mm -hmm. hellbound uh, baby killers or something. Um, it, it, it's baby eaters? Baby eaters, OK, oh, eaters. sorry, sorry, yes. <laughs> I, I didn't bring yeah. any soy sauce yeah. or anything. <laughs> um, uh. So. Um, I'm fairly libertarian, atheist, and I was one of those Ron Paul supporters who went into our local Republican parties, which it takes some stress relief techniques sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot I of actually, shots. Yes. I, I live in Cobb County, which is infamous for many things, mm -hmm. including evolution stickers and school books. Yeah. Um, however, I have not found anyone who was anything other than actually embarrassed that all that happened. Mm. So it's it's as if attitudes are changing inside, but whenever anyone is publicly attacked, they have to respond yeah. the politically correct way, even mm -hmm. though things are changing otherwise. Right. Even Newt Gingrich has changed his public opinion on gay marriage to say that the government shouldn't be um, regulating marriage to begin with, which right. I agree with. Um, I've often actually used the example of, shouldn't we just propose um, regulating baptisms? And then maybe religious folks would understand, you know, the wrong people shouldn't be baptized. Oh, maybe we shouldn't regulate that. Right. Um, but anyway, there's a lot of other examples there when suddenly the person you're talking with realizes that you're not completely insane, they'll talk with you more. And the last one example before I, I'll leave and let you answer. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm signed up. Down so I remember all this. I, I, sorry. I, I'm signed up for chronics, which is kind of weird. Um, but just imagine for a moment that you did believe in chronics, the whole, you know, if you die, you know, freeze, you want to be preserved. You would not want to have an autopsy because that would be like having an autopsy before. You know, if you're in a coma, you know, it wouldn't make sense. I once talked with someone in a convention who was an extreme pro-life person who hated snowflake babies because that's a big thing there. And I made the similarity to someone who's signed up for chronics having the same issues at the end of life as people who are pro-choice at the beginning of, you know, what they consider beginning of life. And suddenly I can communicate with her. She would suddenly open up mm -hmm. and she would realize that some of her beliefs were a bit extreme. So anyway. Right. Uh, thank you for your question. <laughs> so, so sorry. I, I wish I could have said that quicker. I apologize. <laughs> uh, I agree with you that, that you have to find some common ground. We can't just be us versus them all the time. And um, I actually met a lobbyist for uh, the Southern Baptists, very different from the Baptist Joint Committee. The Southern Baptists, um, well, they don't agree with us on much. Uh, but I invited their lobbyists to our office to sit down and try to find one thing, one thing we could agree on. So at least we could not view the other person as just completely out of their mind. And we found something. We found two things that we agreed on. Blasphemy laws. Uh, of course, you know, they only tend to support them when it's a minority of Christians, but blasphemy laws. And humanist chaplains in the military. When I was able to tell him about um, the, the stories that I've heard from members of the military and about specifically, they like to say, okay, so if a dying soldier is, is laying in their arms, uh, the chaplain's purpose is to comfort them and uh, tell them they're going to a better place. And I said, that does, that does nothing for uh, atheists in the military and, and for humanists in the military. And don't you think a person who doesn't think they're going to a better place would need that comfort a little bit more than someone who thinks they're going to paradise? And I had him. <laughs> uh, and 
you know, we found something that we could agree upon. So at least when they sent out, you know, a, a, a letter, an email, a press release that just makes my eyes roll three times around, I can reach out to someone over there and be like, come on, <laughs> really? Um, because I've, yeah, forming that relationship is a, is a huge step in the right direction of getting people at the same table. And some religious allies we have are starting to push back on the more extreme parts, uh, the, the religion extremists, because they've realized uh, when you push it too far, there's pushback. And that we're seeing that more and more, that there's pushback from, from trying to move these goalposts and get more and more and more, and every little inconvenience is a burden on my religion. Now people are, are, are just snapping and going all the way back the other direction. So uh, they're, they're starting to wake up a little bit, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And super quickly, because my time's up. Are there any efforts to try and repeal the Hyde Amendment? Mm. So make sure I'm writing this. The Hyde Amendment bans any federal dollars from going to pay for abortion, correct? Yeah. Right. Um, a lot of people don't realize that that exists. But yeah, that's the case. Um, I would say that's, that's in the, the long-term game plan. First, we have to make them realize that contraceptives are not abort abort efficient. <laughs> that uh, just the normal birth control pill is not considered abort efficient. And then we'll start moving towards a full spectrum of women's reproductive health rights one step at a time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming.